Hello and welcome everyone to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast, brought to you as always by the GSMC Sports Network. I am your host, Chris Shepard. Thank you guys for tuning in. We should have a very exciting show ahead where for the first time I'm going to be using some graphics from GSMC for some of my segments. For the first segment of today's show, we'll be covering the fantasy college football landscape starting off with the quarterbacks. We'll be moving on to the Stars and the Oilers, their game four in the NHL tonight. And we'll also be looking at, yes, IDP League's players especially the linebackers and the D-linemen, and we'll finish off with kind of a weird segment where I'm kind of in a stasis where, you know, the Wolves won last night. I was expecting the Mavs to sweep and for me to talk about this preview, but we'll still talk about all three teams concerned in the NBA this final series. But first, before we begin, we do always ask that you like, follow, and subscribe to our show. And also, if you want to be a big part of our show as well, ooh, sorry, previewing the first segment of today's show, do leave a tip or donation at the link gsmc.cloud. It is a huge support to the network, me, my fellow podcasters as well, so do please consider doing that. It is highly appreciated. Now... Like I said, I kind of previewed my first segment for today's show. It should be a very exciting segment because it is my first time, like I said, using graphics for a segment. We are going to be talking about a very exciting topic, fantasy college football quarterback rankings. Some very exciting quarterbacks, some that we have already discussed on this show, some who are more high profile, and some kind of in the in-between. So without further ado, let's jump right into this segment. It should be very exciting. I'm really excited to focus on lower profile quarterbacks who I think will be very interesting fantasy prospects, especially some that I've already discussed, like I said. Now, we're going to count down backwards. This is the first time I've counted down backwards on this show to build up anticipation, but I think you guys will really like this graphic that I have today. Oop. Starting off at the number 10 spot. We have Mr. Jalen Milrow, a quarterback who came in last year, in the last year of the Nick Saban era, started off kind of rocky, had a rocky start. Nick Saban didn't know whether or not he really wanted to trust him as the Alabama quarterback last season, but then the latter half of the season, he really shined. His dual threat ability showed through, but now I think I know why he has a lower ranking but we'll get to that in a bit. Let's start off with the stats last year. Kind of reflective of how up and down his season was. Only 2,834 yards last year for 23 touchdowns, 6 picks. He was 13th in QBR at 80.5. So kind of in that median where you want to be as a QB. But for a high profile program like Alabama who always wants to compete in the SEC. That is kind of low. But moving into the reasons why I think he is as low as he is, one, obviously the coaching change. Kalen DeBoer from Washington comes in to replace Nick Saban. So we'll have to see how Jalen Milrow progresses under Kalen DeBoer's leadership. Obviously a big part of Jalen Milrow staying is that he does believe in Kalen DeBoer. Obviously, a lot of people thought he might transfer out, but no, he stayed. Kalen DeBoer seems to like him a lot, seems to want to have him progress and become the next big face of Alabama football. So we'll definitely have to see how and what version of Jalen Milrow we get next season. Is it going to be the timid Jalen Milrow who didn't immediately win the starting job, or are we going to get the latter half of the season Jalen Milrow who led Alabama to the college football playoff when it looked like they were in dire straits. Also, another big reason why I think Jalen Milrow is ranked this low is because of his wide receiver group. It's not as talented as it was last year. Gone is Isaiah Bond to Texas. Gone is Jermaine Burton as well, a Georgia transfer last year who was one of his favorite targets. Also, Amari Nyblak, the tight end, gone to Texas as well. But in comes Jeremy Bernard, a Washington transfer, obviously the Kalen DeBoer influence there. Did not play as much for Washington because he was sitting behind one of the best wide receiver groups groups last year in college football, but he wants to be a star. Two other guys, kind of younger guys, Kendrick Law coming in 
Kobe Prentice, who has had limited game action during his time at Alabama. So we'll have to definitely see how Jalen Milrow progresses under Kalen DeBoer, how he integrates this newer wide receiver core. But I'm really excited to see if Jalen Milrow can continue his progress. Coming in at number nine, a quarterback who has been kind of aligned a little bit, kind of been chewed up and spit out, obviously in a pressure cooker environment, moving into an environment that I think might suit him a bit better. Yes, that is Haynes King. I remember Haynes King coming in from the class of 2020, four-star recruit to Texas A&M, wanted to be the face of the Jimbo Fisher era. Jimbo Fisher, obviously collecting a huge recruiting class for Texas A&M, but his progress never truly did translate to Texas A&M. Yes, he had that one occasional good game that every t Texas A&M quarterback for the past couple of years has had against Alabama, but he hasn't really been the guy, but he has the traits. So guess what he does? He transfers to Georgia Tech of the ACC last year, and he had pretty good stats. 2,842 yards, 27 touchdowns, 16 picks though, and only 28th in QBR at 73.2. So you can see see that he has the ability he just needs to put it together but I think moving in from a pressure cooker factory that was the Jimbo Fisher era at Texas A&M to a more comfortable setting where he's not projected to be a huge face of a program I think will work wonders for him he'll just continue to improve he does have a younger receiving core Eric Singleton last year was fourth in yards per game for the team and he was a true freshman last year that just goes to show how inexperienced this wide receiver group is he does bring back Chris Elko and Chase Lane a redshirt senior but those two guys were redshirts last year so Haynes King Obviously, he doesn't have as high profile of a wide receiver group as he wants. He's not as high profile as he used to be. But still, I think that he has merit and could be a nice little steal for a fantasy uh, college football team. Coming in at number eight, this guy has just been rave reviews all around in spring practices for Tennessee he is considered to be the hope for this program as they want to continue their rise in the SEC. Nico Yamalieva. We don't have a lot of history with this guy. We don't know his huge story. He was limited last year. Obviously, they wanted to redshirt him and continue to progress. Obviously, they had Joe Milton already, so he had to sit out last year. He had 314 yards last year. His Citrus Bowl performance kind of up and down. Didn't have as many passing yards, but he did show his dual threat ability. And even though he wasn't ranked, he had a 79.3 QBR last year. This is kind of on blind faith, I think, this ranking for Nico Yamalieva. He has a lot of promise as a five-star recruit. I think a lot of it comes down to his wide receiver group, kind of journeymen group, kind of guys that haven't really shined for Tennessee but want to. Brew McCoy has been a guy who's moved around a lot. He's had only 217 yards last year in five games. Had a really up and down college career. Squirrel White trying to be that number one receiver with 803 yards last year. Only two touchdowns, though. It's just going to show how uneven the Tennessee offense has been over the past couple of years, last year especially. Sorry. But overall, Nico Yamalieva, I think this could be a very interesting ranking. He could move higher. He could move lower. We really don't know because he hasn't had that much game time. So I think right now, this is where he should sit. Moving on to a much more experienced quarterback, a guy who seemingly has been around forever and probably like his, what, seventh year of college football, K.J. Jefferson. Last year kind of saw a little bit of that decline from Big K.J. Only 2,107 yards last year for 19 TDs and 8 interceptions, ranked 88th in QBR last year. But... I think that this ranking proves his experience. I mean, Arkansas has not been that good in the Sam Pittman era as people expect it to be, but K.J. Jefferson has been a solid, highly underrated, underutilized, in my opinion, QB. I think that Sam Pittman has at his arsenal. He doesn't necessarily have that experience of a wide receiver group either. Bryce Stevens was redshirted last year. And one of their best receivers, Andrew Armstrong, had over 1,000 yards, but that was two years ago. So K.J. Jefferson, I kind of I get it. I like K.J. Jefferson as a QB, 
But in terms of fantasy, he's not a guy who's going to stat pad, you know what I mean? You can see the obvious decline as he moves on. Obviously, he's not going to have an NFL career. I kind of feel like he's kind of one of those Michael Penix types. But K.J. Jefferson could prove to be very valuable if Arkansas's easier schedule plays out to his advantage. So I like K.J. at number seven. Moving on to number six, our first group of five representative Jordan McLeod Jordan McLeod last year had a really impressive season at James Madison obviously James Madison transferring from the FCS to the FBS and he was a huge catalyst for why they made that uh, jump so swimmingly I think that Jordan McLeod transferring to Texas State is kind of like a, a lesser Cam Ward when Cam Ward was uh, at Incarnate Word now at Miami from Washington State. So this kind of could be like a feel-good story. KJ stats last, Jordan McLeod stats last year, 3,657 yards, 35 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions, 33rd in QBR. I think that Jordan McLeod has a very exciting team. Isaac Norris, Kylan Evans, young guys, I think that he can rebuild this program, get Texas State to relevancy like he did JMU. But moving on to the number five spot, Jackson Dart. Jackson Dart might be, in my opinion, probably the second best quarterback in the SEC, in my opinion. Obviously, he loses a lot of production, lost Quinshawn Judkins to Ohio State. However, Henry Parrish transfers back from Miami to be his backfield partner. He has Trey Harris, 985 yards last year. Jordan Watkins, very experienced as well. One of the most experienced wide receiver cores in this top 10, in my opinion. He had 3,292 yards last year, 26 TDs, 11 picks. Only 73rd in QBR, but that just go to show the volume of throws that he has under Lane Kiffin. I think this is the season where Lane Kiffin can, can truly say the popcorn is ready. Jackson Dart, top five quarterback in my opinion. Number four, kind of a weird ranking here. You don't really see a lower profile Big 12 QB this high, but Garrett Green of West Virginia is at number four in these rankings. I really don't see why, but he did have a big year last year. 2,406 yards, 16 touchdowns, 4 picks, 20th in QBR. I think that Garrett Green is one of those guys who, on a lesser profile team in a conference that's just adding more teams that are much more talented than West Virginia. He's a senior, he has experience, so we'll have to see how that shakes out. But I don't see him being a high value pick. I don't really like him as high as 4. I've never really known his game as much, obviously, as a fan of the Big 12. Haven't really seen him uh, play a lot, even though as a senior, he does have experience. I think that's what merits this ranking. I just don't feel he's as good as some of the other guys. Coming in at number three of exciting quarterback we have already mentioned on the show, Byron Brown of the USF Bulls. I think that Byron Brown is one of the best group of five quarterbacks, not as good as the guy at number one, who we also mentioned on the show. He had 3,292 yards, 26 touchdowns, 11 picks. I think that Byron Brown is high risk, high reward kind of guy. He wants to be competitive. He wants to be hungry. He wants to develop this young USF team. I think his dual threat ability goes to show that he can shine in some in many areas that people value in a fantasy college football team. I think this is a very exciting ranking for him, but he's not as good as two of the two guys above him. Coming in at number two, one of the probably the best college football quarterbacks of the past five years, if not probably of all time, Dylan Gabriel. What can we say about this man that hasn't already been said before? Over 10,000 passing yards in his college career, moving from UCF to Oklahoma and now at Oregon, where he has an exciting wide receiver core that added Evan Stewart from Texas A&M, a very exciting young receiver, Tez Johnson, a number two option last year behind, obviously, Troy Franklin. But Dylan Gabriel comes in last year. His stats from Oklahoma last year, 3,660 yards, 30 touchdowns, 6 picks, 4th in QBR. Just goes to show how high of a level he plays at. Just an incredible player, in my opinion, for the Oregon Ducks. They get a gem of a quarterback transitioning from Bo Nix to Dylan Gabriel. But he's not as good, in my opinion, as the number one guy. A guy who we mentioned already on the show. Caden Salter of the Liberty Flames. Look, 
here's what you need to know about Caden Salter. I'll tell you his stats before I tell you this. 2,876 yards, not good in yards production, only 32 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, 6th in QBR last year. But here's the thing. Caden Salter last year ranked 3rd in total fantasy points for the entire year. The two guys above him are gone to the NFL. Those were Jaden Daniels and Bonex. That is how good of a player Caden Salter is. And listen, Liberty is trying to be the next UCF, the next Cincinnati, the next Tulane. In a 12-team field for the college football playoff, Liber Liberty wants to be the team that breaks in from the group of five as one of those conference champions. And Caden Salter is a big reason why. He doesn't have the high-profile receivers that some of these guys on this list do. He doesn't have the resources that other guys may have, facilities the other guys may have. But being behind two guys in the NFL, Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix, in terms of fantasy production, that's a guy you want to have on my team. But that will just about do it for this episode for the segment rather of this show coming up next we will be discussing Oilers stars NHL action when we come back from the break I feel like I'm losing my mind is everybody in the world blind please lord give me a sign a sign I feel like I'm losing my mind be the greatest everybody on the face shit i look around and feel like everybody is the fakest i make this every day and i'm impatient hoping one day i blow up from the basement statement the top is so vacant i don't need shit that i think is amazing waiting for my day when i'm playing sold out shows for a thousand faces hey give me that crown getting my way in to be put down it ain't your place all this my town if i want that shit then i'll get it right now i'm losing it the noose if it's a moose shit a stupid myth you choose to live or choose to dip you choose to fight or lose your grip and lose a gift oh I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. Before we get into an exciting segment covering the Oilers and Stars betting odds and fantasy preview for Game 4 tonight, I do ask that you do leave a tip or donation at the link gsmc.cloud. It is a huge support to the network, me and my fellow podcasters, so it is highly appreciated. Now, moving on to our second segment of the show. We're going to cover the Oilers and Stars Game 4 betting preview. Last time we saw these two teams, it looked like the Oilers at home could pull out a huge win to put them up. But the Stars, with a certain player coming back for them, proved too much for the Edmonton Oilers at home. And they come out winning 5-3, a player that we're going to highlight scoring a hat trick on the road. But looking at this game, Dallas minus Oh, I mean, plus 110 for the money line tonight. Edmonton minus 130. The total over under 5.5. I think that's a very fair assessment. Edmonton at home should still be favored, but we're seeing that the money line is kind of decreasing and the points total is staying where it relatively is. But I just want to talk about these two teams fantasy-wise because of the intrigue surrounding both of them. On the Edmonton Oilers side, we can talk about the trio of Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid, Evan Bouchard all day. Obviously, they're the top three point scorers for Edmonton, not only for the team, but in the playoffs as well. But I want to highlight uh, two other guys for Edmonton because in the grand scheme of things, you can't just rely on those three to get you points. You need the team against a team like the Dallas Stars. First up, I'm going to highlight Zach Hyman. Like... Zach Hyman is a first-line player. He has 16 points in this postseason, but only three this series. He did have a goal and an assist last game, but I just think if you're a first-line player who was added to this team to complement Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl's offensive prowess, you need to produce in the playoffs. Zach Hyman 
just hasn't been able to produce in the series. Maybe it's just because of the fact that the Stars have been limiting Edmonton unlike any team in this postseason so far, but he just needs to get going. Another guy on that first line, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, who has been around with Dreisaitl and McDavid for just as long. He needs to... Uh, step his game up both of these guys are valued at a much lower price so if you're looking for a much cheaper option for your fantasy hockey team tonight do look at them they are valued at 7.3k and 5.1k respectively on DraftKings. and zach hyman is projected to have 12.5 fantasy points while nugent hopkins is projected to have 10.7 fantasy points but the reason i want to highlight them is the reality of the situation is edmonton needs those guys to produce it just cannot rely on three players to be the guys who score the points for them this is the dallas stars are not the vancouver canucks where you can limit them to only like 15 to 20 shots per game and you're fine and Stuart skinner doesn't have to do much to help you win obviously Stuart skinner being the weak link of the edmonton oilers but for the Stars' side, they had a major boost last game, and it's all because of the return of their star center, Rupe Hintz. Obviously, he suffered an upper body injury in Game 4 against Colorado last series, but in his triumphant return, he had two assists to a guy who I also want to highlight, Jason Robertson. Both of these guys are valued at 5.2K and 5.9K respectively on DraftKings. So do get them while the going is good. I think that their prices will skyrocket if they play as well as they did last game tonight as well. Just want to highlight both of these players. Obviously, Rupe Hintz is a huge difference maker for the Dallas Stars. He adds so much offensive production. He compliments Jason Robertson, a young guy in his fifth year who's just uh, been kind of a little bit uh, unsettled in this series, but obviously getting a hat trick, mainly due to the fact that Rupe Hintz has been helping him out. And that's the story of this series. Can the Dallas Stars implement all these pl different players, both young and experienced, to overwhelm the Edmonton Oilers, who, while they definitely have players who can score in bunches, are not as deep as this Dallas team. Obviously, now that Rupe Hintz is back from injury and looks fully fit, to no less, I think that Dallas now has a certain advantage that Edmonton simply cannot overcome. I think that Zach Hyman and Ryan Nugent Hopkins can produce, but against that first line that includes both Robertson and Hintz for the Dallas Stars, you have this group of players who are so well connected with each other, they marry so well with each other and they just understand each other overwhelmingly. And I think that that advantage is something that Edmonton has to seek out and try and find a way to adapt to because right now the stars, the stars, stars are overwhelmingly better than the Edmonton stars in this series. And Looking at, you know, on the defensive side of things, the Stars obviously have the more trustworthy players there as well. And Edmonton has its goaltending issues and uh, a little bit of special teams issues in this series, at the very least, that they just haven't had in other series. Like I said before, the Dallas Stars are a different animal than the Vancouver Canucks. The Vancouver Canucks were in the postseason for the first time in forever, since 2011. The Dallas Stars have been here before. They want the Stanley Cup. They were favorites coming into the postseason, and I don't see anything less. That being said, I am picking Dallas to win tonight's game. As an Oilers fan, it does sadden me to say that, but Dallas right now is just so well constructed, and with the return of Rupe Hintz, Look out for him fantasy-wise, because he's cheap now. I don't think he will be cheap by tomorrow. I think that Ultimately, the Stars just have more depth, more production, more reliable players than Edmonton right now. Edmonton has too many question marks. They have been playing well this postseason, but it's mainly due to the fact that they have not faced as good competition as the Dallas Stars thus far. Obviously, Stuart Skinner, he has his problems. Uh, 
the Edmonton's defense had its problems last game where they had a two-goal lead. They could not maintain it. So, ultimately, Dallas is looking to... They already have stolen home ice advantage back from Edmonton. They are just looking to dominate the series. And ultimately, I think tonight is the night where they take over this series. Look for Rupa Hints to be a factor. I am taking the Dallas money line. I am taking the over in terms of goals. I still think Edmonton can produce goals. I don't know whether or not it will come from Hyman or Nugent Hopkins. I do think that they need to produce in order for Edmonton to put up points to equal the Stars, if not better them. But I am going to take the over in terms of total points for tonight's game. I think it's going to be a highly entertaining game. But that will just about do it for the second segment of the show. Coming up, we switch from PPR to IDP. We are going to be taking a look at two position groups, mainly the D linemen and the linebackers for the upcoming fantasy football season for the individual defensive player leagues. This should be a very exciting segment. I'm excited. Y'all should be excited. We will be right back. Looking for your daily fix of sports talk without having to pay for it? GSMC Sports Network is available on YouTube. Just search GSMC Sports Network. Get your fix of daily sports talk shows on YouTube absolutely free. NFL, college football, NBA, MLB, MMA, UFC, fantasy football, and so much more. GSMC Sports Network has shows running all day long with new sports shows starting every two hours. Just like on your favorite cable sports channel, except GSMC Sports Network is absolutely free. Just search GSMC Sports Network on YouTube to catch one of your new favorite shows, like the GSMC College Football Podcast, Chip Shot Football Podcast, Hoops and Heels Women's Sports Podcast, GSMC Basketball Podcast, and so many more. Check it out for yourself. GSMC Sports Network, now available on YouTube. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. We are going to move into a very exciting part of the show. We are switching from PPR rankings from ESPN to IDP rankings for those who play individual defensive player fantasy football. This should be very exciting for you. We are going to start off with the D linemen in terms of rankings. Obviously, the big boys up front, they're going to be your point getters if you should decide to play IDP this season. I think that this is a very reflective list of very talented D linemen, both at end and in the middle of the front. So, it should be very exciting to see. I, I think I'm going to start from number one this time as I don't have a graphic for this one. So, starting off at number one, probably still one of the more underrated D linemen. I know it's weird to say underrated when I'm mentioning this guy because I think of him as one of the best D linemen in the league. But we are going to start off at number one with Max Crosby of the Las Vegas Raiders. Now, I think that Max Crosby last year had one of his best seasons ever 14 and a half sacks, five and a half solo tackles. Now, the Las Vegas Raiders in a transitional period where Antonio Pierce comes in as the head coach, wants a more hard-nosed philosophy. I think that by adding Christian Wilkins to complement Max Crosby, Max Crosby's stats will only be more elevated, and I think Antonio Pierce is just the right head coach to do that. Max Crosby has been a huge vocal supporter of Antonio Pierce, so look for Max Crosby to have a really special year again this year mainly due to the fact that he now has a coach who trusts him to be one of the leaders of this defense. Obviously, Antonio Pierce has said that he wants to build around several other younger players like Robert Spillane, the middle linebacker. But ultimately, when you think of the Las Vegas Raiders defense, it starts and ends with Max Crosby. Now that he has a partner that he can rely on in Wilkins from the Miami Dolphins, I think that Max Crosby is finally going to be recognized as the number one D lineman in the league, deservedly so. And number two, this guy's not bad either. TJ Watt, 19 sacks last year, 48 solo tackles. I think that TJ Watt is the perfect example of someone who marries one level of the defense to another. I think without a player like TJ Watt, the Steelers' secondary will not be as, uh, storied as it has been in the past couple of years. I think that 
TJ Watt just knows how to complement every player in the defense. He knows how to bring the Steelers' defense together. Obviously, they rely on them a lot because of the fact that the Steelers' offense has not been performing these past couple of seasons. So TJ Watt at number two is fine with me because of the fact that he is one of those players who just knows how to bring a position group together. Look for him to be a high-value asset in an IDP league. Coming in at number three, another player who I think can also say this, we can also say the same about Micah Parsons, 14 sacks last year, 36 solo tackles. Obviously not as much production as some of these other guys, but he is listed as a linebacker. So just showing off how versatile he can be, the fact that we can even mention him as a D lineman, the fact that he just shifts around so much in that Dallas Cowboys defense, obviously, you know, but with the loss of Leighton Van Der Esch, you know, I think that Micah Parsons is just going to be a huge asset for IDP, especially if you consider him a D lineman because of the fact that his versatility shows through. And I just respect him as a player who can fit anywhere and on the defensive front at any time of asking. At the number four spot, a guy who I think will have another big season due to a coaching change in Khalil Mack of the Los Angeles Chargers. Obviously, the big question about the Chargers defense was, why has it been underperforming under Brandon Staley? And I think that problem has been solved. Brandon Staley now gone. In comes Jim Harbaugh. But does that immediately fix the defense? No, but Khalil Mack doesn't need fixing. He had 17 sacks last year, 57 solo tackles, so he's not the problem. It's just the fact that I want to see this Los Angeles Chargers defense take that next step up, and Khalil Mack will be a huge part of that, along with Joey Bosa and a young secondary led by Asante Samuel. I'm really excited to see how the Chargers defense handles the coaching change, and I think you have two main guys who can get the job done for you any given time so Khalil Mack very well deserving of that number four spot at number five we have Josh Allen not of the Buffalo Bills but of the Jacksonville Jaguars he had 17 and a half sacks last year 43 solo two forced fumbles as a D lineman an incredible season for him last year in a Jacksonville Jaguars defense that really is very interesting starting to take shape a little bit obviously Trayvon Walker, uh, the, the f- first overall pick a couple of years back, finally getting incorporated into the team. They signed Eric Armstead from the San Francisco 49ers. So they're trying to piece together a nice little defensive front here. But in my mind, it all starts and ends with Josh Allen as the catalyst of this defense. Obviously, the Jacksonville Jaguars are not known for their defensive front as much. They're more known for their secondary. So I think that Josh Allen will have a big year again. His stats will be elevated as the main guy in that D front for Jacksonville. Coming in at number six, a guy who has a change of scenery, a, a, a very nice player who my dad will be very mad, is gone from his favorite team, that is Daniil Hunter, moving from the Minnesota Vikings to the Houston Texans last year. 16 and a half sacks, 54 solo tackles. I think this is a huge signing for the Houston Texans because of the fact that they're building a nice little deep front. D'Amico Ryans, a young head coach, wanting to build to the defense as well. Obviously, he has his offense set as much as uh, he's concerned with CJ Stroud at the QB position and a high-powered offensive attack. Now moving to the defense, D'Amico Ryans also wants to build that. And by signing Daniel Hunter, he's proving that the Texans' defense could be a defense to look out for. Pairing him with Will Anderson Jr. in his second year, I think that is going to be very exciting. Obviously, they're secondary, also young and hungry as well. So look out for the Texans' defense, but especially to Neil Hunter coming in from Minnesota, paired with Will Anderson to wreak havoc in the AFC South. Moving on to number seven, a guy who is starting to be the face of of the Detroit Lions, one of my favorite defensive players, mainly due to the fact that he decided to stay in his hometown. Aiden Hutchinson, what a guy. 36 solo tackles, 11 and a half sacks, three forced fumbles last year. I just love Aiden Hutchinson, man. Just the face of that Detroit Lions defense, such a likable presence up front. And 
In terms of defensive prowess, the Detroit Lions are one of those up and down defenses. They want to focus on the secondary. I think they're starting to get the pieces up front with uh, John Kaminsky, Aiden Hutchinson, Alex Anzalone at the linebacker spot. So they're starting to round into form a little bit. But ultimately, I just want to see how Dan Campbell focuses on the defense. Obviously, we saw with the offense, he's willing to take a lot of risks. I want him to see how he progresses with the defense as well. And Aiden Hutchinson is a perfect face for that movement. And number eight, a little bit low for Miles Garrett, but... For someone who has been such a fantastic defensive player for the past couple of seasons, he can rank anywhere in the top 10 and people wouldn't be mad. 33 solo tackles last year, 14 sacks, and 4 forced fumbles. It's a force of nature and really the catalyst for Brown's defense for being as good as it was last year, obviously, trying to uh, compete with the AFC North, obviously. Down went Deshaun Watson, and their offense was in disarray, and the defense really kept them afloat by being the number one defense in the league. Miles Garrett finally got that running partner last year in Zadarius Zer- Smith. Um, so I just think that Miles Garrett is always going to be a top 10 D lineman in the league, no matter who he's playing with, just because of his willingness to perform and look for the Browns to be one of the best defenses in the league yet again with Jim Schwartz leading them. And number nine, an interesting player, mainly due to the fact that one of his uh, running mates last year left him, and Derek Brown. He had 57 solo tackles, only two sacks, though. Now, for the Carolina Panthers, obviously they don't really have that many big names, either on the offense or the defense, except for Derek Brown. He needs to be the face of that Carolina Panthers defense, and that is enough said. Two sacks is not enough, but... It could be due to the fact that this next guy I'm going to mention uh, left him, and I think that that production will go up. I think that since Carolina is going to be below average yet again this year, Derek Brown's stats could be elevated. But moving on to the guy who left him, rounding out our top 10, Brian Burns, moving from Carolina to New York. And honestly, the New York Giants defense is rounding into shape. They have the the front up front and Dexter Lawrence, Kayvon Thibodeau. Now they add Brian Burns and his 32 solo tackles and eight sacks from last year. I really like this addition for New York. It sh- pr- goes to show that they want to build through the defensive front. Brian Dable wants to adapt a more defensive philosophy because of the fact that there are so many question marks surrounding the offense. But Brian Burns, look for him to be a huge value asset for an IDP league. I really like this top 10, but that'll just about do it for this segment. I really enjoyed ranking these D-linemen with you guys, but coming up next, we move from D-linemen to the second level of the defense, the linebackers, coming up next on the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Hello and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. We are in the home stretch of the show, my second to last segment. We ranked the D linemen last segment, but right now it is time for the linebackers to shine through. So let me get my trusty, dusty graphic. Uh, as you can see, and we have number 10 already, but we'll get into that. Uh, I think this linebacker ranking is very reflective of guys who are hard nosed want to get to the ball, good on and off the ball, very rangy, very versatile in their respective positions. So let's get right into it. As you can see, right at number 10, Mr. Nick Bolton. Now, I think that people really underestimate Nick Bolton just because of the fact that in Steve Spagnuolo's defense, the two main guys are Chris Jones and George Karloftis. They are the guys who get all the sacks, they get all the love, 
the, the reason that Nick Bolton may not be as well known a name in the NFL last year. He had no sacks, only 22 solo tackles, but that's probably reflective of Jones and Carlotta's production up front. However, I do still think that Nick Bolton is an excellent off-ball linebacker, very rangy, plays from sideline to sideline. As we saw two years ago in the Super Bowl, had a huge play. Um, I think that ultimately this might end up being too low for Nick Bolton. He's not a guy who's going to get as many stats as you would like him to, but he's a huge value in real life for the Chiefs, and he could be huge value in an IDP league as well. I think that for a person who might get second level tackles i think that nick bolton is better than any at that and so i'm glad to see him in this top 10 moving on to the number nine spot we have ej speed of the indianapolis colts obviously a nice up and coming linebacker here very solid pairing with a guy who will mention later on in these rankings but looking at the colts defense they have a lot of depth up front and they are starting to build in the back as well this could be a defense that really breaks from the mid-level defenses of the league to the top half obviously Shane Steichen doing a good job in year one on both fronts I think that EJ Speed last year he had 24 solo tackles in one sack only a little bit higher than Nick Bolton but I think that now that the Colts are transitioning their defensive uh, front, I think that EJ Speed will now come to prominence. Uh, if you look at the Indianapolis defense, they have guys like Quiddy Pay and DeForest Buckner drafted Layatu Latu this year in the defensive front. In the back end, they have Kenny Moore and Juju Brents, so they really are building a nice system, and EJ Speed should be a huge part of that as well. Coming in at number eight, TJ Edwards of the Chicago Bears and uh, let me just talk about the Chicago Bears defense for a while they are really going to be a very exciting defense over the next couple of years not just the offense but the defense I really like TJ Edwards as a player he had 64 solo tackles two and a half sacks last year very nice player but this Chicago Bears defense right now is reflective of how high these players are ranked. I think that ultimately, when you look at the Chicago Bears, you don't think of them right now as a defensive team, but they have exciting depth in the backfield with Quan Brisker and Tyreek Stevenson and moving up to the front. I really like the Chicago Bears defense, and I think that TJ Edwards is going to be a nice asset in IDP League for anyone. Coming in at number seven, we have a guy who's very experienced, one of the most experienced players on this list in Levante David. I think Levante David's ranking is reflective of the fact that he might be the new leader of this Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. They're, they're molding uh, older players in the front with more younger players in the back. You're mixing in guys like Joe Tryon, Shayinka, Yaya Diaby in your front, the big guy, Vita Vea. But... You obviously are losing a guy in Shaquille Barrett to the Miami Dolphins who was your older leader up front. And now that becomes a guy like Levante David, who last year had 48 solo tackles and five and a half sacks. So look for Levante David to be the heartbeat of this Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense, uh, incorporating and implementing all these different players that the Bucks have. They should be a very exciting defense to watch if Levante David can step up and take over the mantle of Shaquille Barrett. Coming in at number six on this list, a guy who can be seen as higher or lower. I think that this could be a little bit low for someone like Fred Warner, but ultimately I think that because he's in such a high-profile defense as the 49ers, this is why he is much lower than people think he should be. I think he is too low as well. He has 59 solo tackles and two and a half sacks last year. Obviously, his stats might be lower than people would want in a defense that's high profile as San Francisco's, but it just goes to show the depth that San Francisco has in their defensive line. That's all that can really be said about why a guy like Fred Warner is this low, but Fred Warner is probably one of, if not the best linebackers in the league right now.
Coming in at number five, another guy who I really love in another defense that is one of the best in the league, Roquan Smith. It's kind of like the roamer in this mid in the, in the middle of this uh, Baltimore Ravens defense that is so vaunted. Obviously, they lose their defensive coordinator in Mike McDonald. However, I think that Roquan Smith, he had 84 solo tackles last year, only one and a half sacks is going to be another leader of this team. Obviously, you have Justin Matabuike in your D front, and you lose Geno Stone in your backfield as you have a guy like Marlon Humphrey back there and Arthur Millett's a young up-and-comer. But Roquan Smith has just been doing it for so many years, whether as a Bear, now as a Raven. I just think that Roquan Smith is such a vaunted player representative of the, what the Baltimore Ravens defense wants to be, and I think that he's well-deserving of a top-five spot. Moving into more of the top four, we have Zaire Franklin, both him and Speed from the Indianapolis Colts coming in. I think the reason why we are seeing these guys in this list is not just because of their own abilities, but because of the fact that the Colts' defense is kind of going to become a bit younger as the years go on, and I think that you need those that linebacking group in the middle of that defense to be the heart and soul, and I think that Zaire Franklin, EJ Speed will become that for them. And also, they lost a guy who moved on, and we're going to talk about sooner rather than later. I think that they're going to become the new faces of the Indianapolis Colts. Zaire Franklin stats, 72 solo tackles, one and a half sacks. I just think that ultimately the guy they lost, who I'm going to mention, was a huge star for them. And now these two need to pick up the pace for this uh, young transitioning defense. Coming in at number three, the guy who I've been kind of centering everything around, Bobby Okereke, uh, last year moved to the Giants. Had a good season for them. 92 solo tackles, two and a half sacks. But I think that Bobby Okereke, uh, is going to be a high-profile player in a Giants defense that really is going to progress this season with all these pieces that they've added, like Brian Burns. Obviously, they, they also built the draft, getting Kayvon Thibodeau, and Dexter Lawrence, who has been there for a couple of years. I really am very high on the Giants defense and very high on Bobby Okirake as well, a guy who can get you a lot of tackles, a guy who is very rangy. So look for Bobby Okirake to have... Very nice stats in an IDP league. Coming in at number two overall is a guy who I really like in a defense that I really don't necessarily like that much. Foye Oluokun at number two overall. He had uh, uh, 74 solo tackles and four and a half sacks last year. I think that this is a guy who I think that in the Jaguars defense that really doesn't have that much depth to it, especially in their front seven. I think that Foye Oluokun it has to be the bait guy in this year. Obviously, they signed Eric Armstead to fill out their defensive front, but they really don't have that much depth in their defensive front, like I said before, with Josh Allen in the D lineman rankings. However, I think that Foyo Oluokun is adapting to that role in spades. I think that the Jaguars defense will progress under him. And I'm really excited to see him have another huge year. But coming in at number one, a guy who I think will deserve this by years and might not deserve it now, but Ernest Jones IV, a guy who might be seen as the new face of the Rams defense now that big man Aaron Donald is gone. That is the huge question concerning the Rams defense. Who will step up to replace Aaron Donald as the face of the Rams defense? Obviously, you have young guys who broke out last year, like Kobe Turner and Byron Young. You drafted Jared Verse. You're wanting to get younger on your front. You want to find the next Aaron Donald. But the truth is, you just can't. Aaron Donald was just so excellent for the Rams for many years. However, I think that Ernest Jones at the second level, obviously, he had 111 solo tackles and two and a half sacks. Really nice year last year for him. But ultimately, 
Ernest Jones is going to be the heartbeat and soul of the Rams defense to years to come just because he is in the middle level of that defense. But that is just about going to do it for these linebacker rankings. Coming up for the last segment of the show, kind of a weird segment where I talk about a finals preview that was kind of ruined by the Timberwolves. We'll get into that when we get back from the break. Hello and welcome back everyone to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. We are at the last segment of today's show and it is going to be kind of a weird segment because I have both good and bad news about this segment. The good news is that because of what happened last night, I get to talk more about basketball before the NBA Finals. Obviously, we have a long layoff before the NBA Finals coming up in almost two weeks. So... I have a lot more to talk about. I'm really excited to talk about. But the bad news was the Timberwolves did win. And my segment was about the Celtics-Mavs potential finals preview. So I'm kind of stuck in this stasis where uh, I wanted to talk about a potential Celtics-Mavs final. The first time in forever that we have two teams that have swept in the conference finals. But it didn't happen. So I'm kind of stuck with talking about three teams rather than two teams in the NBA Finals. But kudos to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, They did exactly what I thought they needed to do. Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns outscored Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving last night. So that was one of the huge catalysts as to why they won the game and ultimately are still in this series. But overall, I'm kind of disappointed I don't get to talk about an NBA Finals matchup that had some intriguing storylines just yet. But first of all, before I talk about both the Timberwolves and the Mavs and what the Mavs' plan could be should they win Game 5, let's say kudos to the Celtics right now. Uh, Our Eastern Conference Finals representative, Go Celtics! Um, Ultimately, you know, they have had their controversies. 12-2 12-2 and two record. They haven't really played any major stars. And whoever comes out of the West will probably be their toughest matchup yet this postseason. However, by hook or by crook, they proved that they were a different team than last year. Obviously, I could be sitting here saying that both the Timberwolves and the Pacers are like 3-1 up in the series. And no one will bat an eye. But the Celtics are where they are because of the fact that they have been able to adapt and Joe Missoula has proven that he can adapt as well. He was a big question mark for the Celtics coming into this year. So congratulations to the Boston Celtics for advancing to the NBA Finals, sweeping the Indiana Pacers. So we will talk about them a little bit later on. But switching back to Game 4 last night, the Wolves ultimately staying alive and winning 105-100. to But like I said before, the Wolves did what they needed to do last night, what I wanted them to do for this entire series, and that is have their stars be present. Anthony Edwards, the big question about him was the fact that could he keep up with the pace of a guy like Kyrie Irving, a guy like Luka Doncic, and 
throughout the series he just couldn't but last night even though it wasn't his best shooting performance of all time he still had 29 points cat had 25 and ultimately that minnesota timberwolves duo outdueled the dallas mavericks duo of luca and Kyrie. ultimately though i still think that dallas is going to want to win game five and i think they will in fact i just think that this game was one of those games where the, Ma the, the Timberwolves did everything right, and the Mavs, even though they still have that prowess, Luka Doncic still had his uh, triple-double, they just couldn't match Minnesota on tonight. It's another one of those close games, you know. It's, it's where you can't really find out the difference between these two games, and ultimately came down to the clutch minutes where Minnesota had struggled before, but ultimately they closed out tonight. So, moving on to the keys should the Mavs win uh, game five and move on to the finals as people expect I think that last night's game proved a lot one thing was the loss of Derek Lively obviously that was my, that was my mistake last night I, I fully expected him to play but he had suffered a neck sprain in game three and that is why he did not play tonight and the return of Maxi Kleba from injury so just that weird transition from a guy who has been giving you such good minutes off the bench as a paint presence down low to a guy who's just coming off a shoulder injury and might be a bit more tentative. It adds an intriguing storyline to the fact that should the Mavs progress, now they also have big man issues as well and Jason Kidd really needs to figure out a solution. Does he want to play a guy like Kleba who has more experience or does he want the youth and uh, energy of a Derek Lively off the bench. Last night, a, a bright spot, in my opinion, for the Dallas Mavericks was Daniel Gafford, who obviously was probably the only person who I hit on in my uh, prop bets and predictions last uh, episode. He had a perfect uh, game in terms of field goal shooting, 6 for 6 for 12 points. Ultimately, he is still a big part of who Dallas is down low, but that was a huge factor. And should the Mavs progress, I think that uh, ultimately Jason Tate, I mean Jason Kidd, rather, is going to have a huge question on his hands. Moving on to the Celtics, like I said uh, a couple segments ago, last episode, I think that they also have a very similar problem. Kip Kristaps Porzingis is going to be coming back from an injury, and uh, Joe Mazzulla is going to have to figure out how to distribute minutes between big men he hasn't really played. Last series, we saw that O'Shea Brissett got some minutes in Game 3, and they were some of the best minutes for a Boston big man in that series. Obviously, Al Horford adds a lot offensively, but... Ultimately, he could be a liability defensively. So Joe Mazzula has that same issue. So that should be an intriguing storyline. But moving back to the subject at hand, the team who is still not out of it just yet, the Minnesota Timberwolves. What are their keys to keeping this series going for as long as possible? Obviously, not many teams have come back from 3-0 deficits. In fact, only 39% of teams have even won a game down 3-0. But as we saw... If Jason Kidd is indecisive for the rest of the series between Kleba and Lively, that could be a way in for the Timberwolves because then they have the advantage in the front court of having guys like Cat and Rudy Gobert defensively to, to help combat them. And I think that ultimately this game might be an outlier in the fact that Jason Kidd may have seen that Kleba might need some time to come back and, and acclimate to game time. But I still think he's an option off the bench for them. And so that's just going to be an interesting thing going forward. And the fact that Minnesota extended the series should be an interesting sign for Dallas to try and see how this whole center thing works out. But before we count our chickens before they hatch, Minnesota has to perform in Game 5 as well. You can't just win Game 4 and expect the rest of the series to go your way you need to continue to play there's a reason they're down 3-0 and it's because of the mistakes they've made late in games and they need to continue to figure out ways to win games late in games ultimately should they somehow come back and win the series that would be an interesting storyline as well if the celtics were so good late in games and minnesota has been so bad late in games in this series so that would be another interesting storyline but that would be so far ahead and very unlikely but the key to 
the Timberwolves continuing this series is the fact that Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards need to consistently outscore Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving and find a way to stop them on the defensive end of the ball. Congratulations to them for not tiring out, but that cannot be an excuse. This game, if you want to extend this series, longevity and and uh, the ability to uh, be able to play a number of minutes that might be higher than usual for you, you need to do that. And so, I think that Game Four should be a nice little uh, uh, examination of who the Timberwolves can be if both of them play well, but ultimately. I think that they need to continue to do this consistently to prove the fact that they are still not out of it. Just before I uh, end the show right here, I just want to stick around and uh, give you guys the updated betting odds for NBA Finals favorites. Obviously, Jason Tatum is still at the top, followed by Luka Doncic, but we see Jalen Brown move up to the third spot above guys like Anthony Edwards and Kyrie Irving. And also, a guy who... Might be flying under the radar because of his injury. Chris Stats Porzingis is sitting sixth in uh, NBA Finals betting odds for MVP. I think that he could be a very high, interesting, uh, high risk, high reward uh, bet at plus 4,000 if you really want to be aggressive in that area and bank on him being a huge impact for the Celtics in the finals. But the finals aren't here yet, like I thought they would be. But that should just about end today's episode of the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. As always, I do ask that you like, follow, and subscribe to the show. Leave a tip or donation at the link gsmc.cloud. is a huge support to the network. Thank you guys for tuning in. My name is Chris Shepard. Thank you again. Let's go.